Find your future by exploring your world. The Massachusetts School of Law challenges their students to explore the important issues of our time, learning from experts in fields like politics, sports, and business law. From first-hand accounts and dramatic reenactments, in-depth conversations with society's leaders, from historians to lawyers, from high-tech professionals to environmental experts, the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover presents MSLaw.edu. Hello and welcome to Times Square here in New York City. I'm Diane Sullivan, your host for today's program. We're here in New York to let the New York Times op-ed columnist and author Gail Collins take us through five decades of women's progress, as discussed in her book, When Everything Changed, The American Journey of American Women from 1960 to the Present. Close your eyes and reflect back to 1960. What careers and jobs were women engaged in? Surprisingly, only 6% of all doctors, 3% of all lawyers, and less than 1% of all engineers were women. Women were banned from the Boston Marathon, and on television, you found them principally in the kitchen. Women needed permission from their husbands to get a credit card. If you look back at 1960, for instance, um, although there were certainly a number of amazing women who were doctors or lawyers or, you know, did, and there was one in the Senate, and there were um, a few in the House, but they weren't a pattern. They didn't lead to more people. When Margaret Chase Smith was in the Senate, her work, which was amazing, did not lead to there being a lot more women senators. They were always these sort of exceptions to the rule. Uh, the women in World War II who worked and who then were able to do almost anything because there were so few men around were exceptions to the rule. And society is always kind of comfortable with saying, well, yes, but here's the rule, but this person is different. But at least our society is. But the idea in general was always that women stayed at home, that they were the mothers and they were the wives and they stayed in the house. You make a point very early on in your book to follow up on this conversation, and it really made me think about my own early years, that most of us grew up at a time where we never saw a female doctor, lawyer, bus driver, police officer, uh, no women that were visible in those particular roles. So talk a little bit about the use of quotas and employment discrimination and how that began to change. There were two ways that it changed. One from the outside was that, I mean, until the 1960s, um, it was, many schools were very upfront that they had quotas. I remember one medical school said, well, yes, we have a quota, but we don't want our one woman doctor, our one woman medical student to feel alone. So we always bring in two every year so that they won't be unhappy. And law, I mean, law schools the same way. At dental schools, there was the head of the dental school, I think the University of Texas in the, the 60s said that uh, women could not be dentists because they weren't strong enough to pull teeth. I mean, there was a really <laughs> strong sense that women shouldn't be doing this stuff. They didn't really want them around. And it was all perfectly legal. You know, it was perfectly legal for businesses to say, as they often did, that this wasn't a job for a woman. Um, there's um, just so many ex examples of women who went out and applied for jobs and were just told, well, we don't have women for that. You know, Nora Ephron told me the first time she went to Newsweek and applied for a job. They said, well, women don't write here. They do research, but they don't write. And uh, many of the most famous female writers of our time <laughs> were told by Newsweek that women don't write at that point in time. And all those things were legal. It was legal to say that women couldn't be in management because it was bad for the men. Um, you know, all that stuff was okay. Or that women got paid less for the same job. That was, people put that on lists. That was not, you know, something that you tried to hide. And of course, the help wanted ads were all help wanted men or help wanted women. Right. And, you know, the receptionist jobs were over here and the good stuff was in the other way. So the two ways that changed were one, in 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was going through, a representative from the South, an 80 odd year old, very, very conservative guy, added gender to the things you could not discriminate against in employment and it was a joke on mm -hmm. his part. And I think also it was an attempt to slow down the bill and complicate things. But Martha Griffiths, who was the only woman lawyer in the House at that time, grabbed hold of this and brought her people 
and added them to the conservative Southerners and actually got it passed. And then it went to the Senate where they were also going to take it out, and Margaret Chase Smith grabbed hold of it and ran through and got a touchdown. At that point, there was virtually no woman in this country who thought there should be a law prohibiting discrimination in employment because of gender. That seemed so far out in the future. Sure. The women at the Commission on the Status of Women, the most radical women there, were hoping that someday there'd be a study commission on this. Nobody was thinking about this. But then suddenly it was in the law. And once it was in the law and women realized that the government was not planning on enforcing that part of the law, then they went crazy. And that's when the National Organization for Women was founded. That's when women started to go to court to sue. And that was really the beginning on one side of all the changes. The other thing that happened was that the birth control pill came on the market. And although people were discriminating against women, it's also true that very few women applied to law school or medical school or any kind of a job that required a really long-term commitment for preparation back in the 60s and before because they, they all believed you should marry very young because that was the average age of marriage was 20 in 1960. And that once you got married, you know, you, there was not much you could do to really prevent, totally prevent pregnancy. So people were very reluctant to make a commitment to a long-term career at that time. That's right. And you mentioned on, early on in your book, Sylvia Roberts, who graduates from Tulane Law School, late 50s, as I recall. But in 1960, in the entire state of Louisiana, you cannot find one law firm that will take an application from a female. So why were women even contemplating law school when the likelihood of them ever having a career was was pretty non-existent? I have to say that throughout all the stuff I've written about women in American history, the women who most knock me out are the ones who just stand up and say, this is what I'm going to do when there is nobody around them who thinks it's a good idea. Yeah. We're really used now to, you know, you go girl and you, know, you get support no matter what you want to do from somebody. but. Back then, people like Sylvia, who just said, I want to be a lawyer, and nobody said, okay, do that, it's a good idea. She had no role models. When she got out of law school, she wound up uh, for a while being a clerk to one of the Supreme Court justices in Louisiana, but they took the word clerk seriously. She was supposed to file yeah. and type, and then she became a secretary at a law firm because there was just no thought of anybody hiring a woman lawyer. Take us back to 1960 when women are now celebrating their, their constitutional right to vote, 40 years, rah, rah, rah. But you take a look in the Senate, you have two female senators. You look in the 435 seat House, you have 17 women. And as you previously just stated, only one of these 19 women have a law degree. How did they end up in Congress and when did that open up? There was really only one permanent, reliable career track for a woman who wanted to be in Congress before the 70s, really. Mm -hmm. And that was you married a congressman and waited till he died. <laughs> and you took over lots of widows. A lot of those, those women who were in the House uh, in the 60s and in the 50s and before that were widows. Um, and some of them were amazing. Margaret Chase Smith was a widow. But, um, but, and a lot of the others were not amazing. They were just sort of sitting there, sitting in the seat, uh, holding out their time. But that was really the only way you got in. And that the critical change was the moment in which women actually became politicians unto their own selves and not because of their husband. The amazing other thing about Martha Griffiths, who was from Michigan, was that she was part of a political couple. Her husband Hicks was the head of the Democratic Party, I think, in either in Detroit or in the state. And there have been many political couples in America, back to John and Abigail Adams, but I think they were the first ones in which the political couple was working on the woman's career rather than on the husband's. They were both doing Martha's career, and he was totally into it, totally supportive, totally excited about all the stuff she did, and uh, they were the first, I think. Well, you mentioned later on in the book that in 1977, a national opinion survey was, was done in which it was still believed by most people in America that women ought to support their husband's career more than, you know, strive to have a career for themselves. So that notion that women put all their efforts into their own career is really new. It's very new, and um, 
the seventies were so interesting to me because in the sixties you had this period, late sixties of intense litigation and tons of laws being passed in Congress. There was this very, very, you look how fast this all changed. You go from the world that I was describing when anything went as far as discriminating against women were concerned from 1964 to 72 basically legally that all changed in this country and you, you had during that little tiny period they abolished discrimination in jobs uh, title nine was passed abolishing discrimination in education and also of course that brought in women's sports they abolished discrimination in credit they passed in congress the equal rights amendment um, they also passed a law in 71 providing a bipartisan bill providing an entitlement to quality early childhood education for all the children of working women in the country, which was then vetoed. But there, I think often part of that was there was this moment in American history when the Republican Party, which had always been the party that was more socially liberal, really, when it came to things like women's rights, mm -hmm. like um, family planning, things like that. The Republicans started to move to the right, and the Democrats, who had always been more conservative on these things, started to move to the left. And there was really this little period in the late 60s and early 70s where they kind of came together, and so much stuff got done. It was just incredible. It was a very, very fast time. And the 70s, to me, were a time of digestion, and the country kind of dealing with this. And some things the country came to embrace really rather easily and became part of our lives. And some the country had a lot of trouble with and we're still having arguments about it today. Talk a little bit about television and the role that women played in drama series as anchors, as female correspondents back in the 60s and 70s. In the 60s still, you know, when, when TV began, when anything new begins, mm -hmm. any big new industry, radio, commercial aviation, any of that stuff, early on women often do very well because it's sort of disorganized, it doesn't pay all that well, it's kind of messy, and you can just kind of jump in and do stuff. Then when it becomes a very big deal, women tend to get, or at least tended in those days, to get pushed out. Television in the very early days, when you go back to, say, the days of I Love Lucy, you can remember a lot of TV shows, many of them kind of dumb. I mean, you wouldn't want My Little Margie to be your sort of role model, but <laughs> lots of shows featuring women in important roles. Then when you hit, when television became a very big deal, they all went away, and you really had no shows in which women were the main characters. And particularly in the 60s, westerns were the huge thing, you know, adventures, yeah. westerns, and they were all about some guy, usually riding alone out there in the west. And uh, women never showed up except when they were being kidnapped or, you know, in danger <laughs> in some way. And it really, the message I got when I was a kid watching all these shows, I remember Bonanza so well, you yeah. know, you had this guy who owned this big ranch, and he's a widower. In fact, he's been a widower three times, and he has three sons, one from each dead wife. And the sons are always falling in love with somebody, and instantly this girl dies. I mean, really, you walk near the Ponderosa and you are dead. It's all like a toxic landmine for women. And the message you got from that, if you were a young girl watching, was that girls do not have adventures. Girls stay home, and they, if you watch the situation comedies, they wander around the kitchen in high heels with pearls on, stirring <laughs> something a lot, you know. But they hardly go out the door. They're just sort of <laughs> sitting there in the kitchen all day long. And it was a very repressive and small vision of what women could be. Discuss, if you would, the introduction of the Barbie doll and the significance of the Barbie image. Yeah, Barbie was the, you know, dolls were... Um, you know, the little sort of chunky baby things, you know, and, and they were sort of stocky like little girls, little toddlers. And suddenly Barbie came along, and Barbie was um, the first doll with sort of an adult kind of figure that most little girls had ever seen. It came along in the late 50s, really hit it big in the 60s. And um, a lot of the women that I talked to in the book really remembered their first Barbie, and, you know, she had breasts, and this teeny tiny waist and she had this totally irrational kind of figure that no human being ever has. And um, then Ken came along. I cannot tell you how many women told me that <laughs> Ken and Barbie were having a lot more sex than I thought, you know, <laughs> under the washcloth usually they said, you know, there'd be a thing going at it. So. You write in your book that once couples got married in the 60s, it was expected 
that they would stay that way. So how did marriage change the option for women? It was, you know, if you were living in a society in which women got married early, and partly they got married early because you had a double standard that presumed that women should be virgins when they got married. That was one of the huge changes in the 60s, was the elimination of that double standard, that women should be virgins and men were allowed to go out and get as much sex as they could. So in order to protect your virginity, women tended to get married very young. And then, if that thought is abroad in the land, if you're a woman and you plan to get married, you have to realize that by the time you're 24, there aren't going to be any men left. <laughs> you know, already there was yeah. a demographic problem because women tended to marry men who are a little older. So you had the women who were from that big baby boom generation looking for husbands among the men who had been born during World War II when things were, when there was much, a much lower birth rate. So there were fewer guys anyway. And then they're all getting married very early. So if you, once you get out of college and go out into the world, there are hardly any unmarried guys around. So women had a good reason to be kind of worried if they weren't married by the time they left college. And it was a huge thing back in the 50s and the early 60s that you had to be engaged by your junior year or your senior year at the latest, or you were just dead meat. It was all over for you. <laughs> so that was really important, the idea of getting married fast. And not being an old maid. And not being an old maid. So if you're going to get married fast, then birth control until the 60s wasn't very, so you know, really, in order to have a career, you had to take a vow of chastity. I mean perpetual taking of the veil in order to make it and go through it because there was all this stuff pushing you in the other direction. So to close up the first part of your book, let me ask you, did women feel happy or did they feel trapped in the 1960s as their role as a housewife and as a mother? Sort of both. You know, um, when I did the book before this one, when I talked about women earlier in this country's history, it was very liberating to me because there was always this horrible vision that women were such weenies and just mm -hmm. never, you know, gave in and stayed home and then suddenly in the 60s and the 70s we got our power and took over. If you look at the choices that women had, to become a full-time housewife was the job where you chose management. You know, that was the job where you were left alone to run things by yourself. And the jobs in the outside world were in general jobs where you had to either obey some woman because you were a domestic or obey some man because you were in a factory. But there were, there were no visions for most women of this great job in the outside where you're going to become a brain surgeon or something. So to become a full-time housewife was a very reasonable and often empowering choice for women right. for most of our history. But once you get into the 60s, you have first of all got the first generation of women whose families could afford to send them to college even if they weren't planning on a super career. So there was a whole generation of sort of post-World War II women who went to college because there was an economic boom, their families could afford it, and they figured their girls would marry guys who had college degrees, better for them. So a lot of women went to college, took the same courses as the guys, learned the same stuff, were interested in the same things, and then once they're out, everything turns around and they're supposed to be home hanging up the laundry while their husbands are out. And a lot of them were shocked to find they were not happy. It was a surprise to them <laughs> as well as the country <laughs> yeah. when it turned out that they were really you know, not thrilled. You know, that said, there were still millions of women who were very happy in the 60s. They felt like they were doing better than their mothers. They'd never been taught to compare their lives to guys. They compared their lives to other women, and it seemed to them they were doing great. So you had a combination of the economy's booming, people are moving up, everybody's happy, women are used to their kind of lives they had, and then this little group of women growing larger every year who had been raised to to do stuff but yet then when the time came they were supposed to go home and they were the Betty Friedan generation the feminine mystique women who had this problem they couldn't identify and suddenly realized oh yeah it's because I'd like to have a job Earning your law degree shouldn't burden you with overwhelming debt. At Massachusetts School of Law at Andover, we believe it should be affordable, achievable, and yes, even an enjoyable first step to your successful career.
We believe in an atmosphere of support, flexible class scheduling, and hiring professors with real-world experience, ensuring you leave law school with the professional skills you need. We are the most affordable law school in New England, and we believe in you. The Massachusetts School of Law. Your future starts here. My favorite part of your book is section two, when everything changed. You see that the women are growing restless. You see that women are needed in the workforce. So this combination of factors helps fuel, I think, the women's movement. But let's talk a little bit about the EEOC and when it opened its doors. Who were the first complainants? You know, the EEOC was the organization set up to enforce the civil rights law as far as employment was concerned. And everybody presumed that it would be some, you know, black steel worker who would be coming in, you know, waiting to get justice. And the first people in the door were the stewardesses, who had long been aware, obviously. They were the girls from their schools who wanted to travel. We think of, you know, those early stewardesses now as sort of coffee, tea, or me. But these were the adventurous girls from their small towns or wherever they came from who wanted a job that involved getting out, excitement, travel, and that was the only job you could get that involved travel if you were a woman back then. And once they got the job, they realized that they were going to be fired as soon as they got married, and that most places also laid them off when they turned 30. Uh, and you know they're being measured every day. I mean, basically the whole job was an invitation to sexual harassment on a daily basis. I mean, they were all about being attractive and cute and serving men in the planes and weighing in and, and weighing in every morning. And there was one famous flight, the executive flight from New York to Chicago every day that women were not allowed to buy tickets for. You could only be a man on the executive flight, and they were served roast beef and cigars and the stewardesses lit the cigars for them. It was, it drove working women completely nuts at the time. But, um, so they knew better than anybody exactly, you know, how deep discrimination ran and they were the first ones in the door. It drives me nuts hearing about it, <laughs> reading about it in any event. And it's interesting not to digress much. I once did a television show with Patricia Ireland, who was then the sure, president yeah. of NOW. And she said to me, and I did not know this in her background, she, she began as a, as a stewardess of the time and said to me, can you just imagine me saying coffee or tea, which shall it be, you know? So really, you know, it's surprising some of the roots of the early feminists. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit and introduce the audience to Lorena Weeks, who you write about, and her landmark decision that really changed things for working women. In the 60s, once NOW was established, when, when people first started organizing the National Organization for Women, they kept saying, we want an NAACP for women. They envisioned something that would go out and file lawsuits on behalf of women. Uh, the only problem was that the NAACP by then was this great, huge, respected thing with large donations and many, many lawyers, and NOW had, you know, this one poor woman named Marguerite Raywald, who was uh, retired, who was a lawyer in Washington, who was kind of organizing everything and getting letters. And Lorena Weeks was very typical of the women who were being undone by earlier good-hearted attempts to protect women by passing legislation that said that there should be different working conditions for men and women. Many states had rules, for instance, that said that women couldn't lift anything that was more than like 30 pounds, or that women couldn't be forced to work overtime, the theory being that then um, you know, they need to be home with their kids. But in fact, what happened was they couldn't get any overtime. Uh, in some states, women um, who had small children you couldn't, you, the, you know, companies didn't hire them because the presumption was they should be home with the small children. Of course, the women didn't have that option, but so they became waitresses instead of whatever. But uh, Lorena was working for the phone company down in Georgia, and she uh, was married and um, had always worked hard her whole life, had raised her younger brother and sister, and then by then was married and had children, and she and her husband were desperate that their kids should go to college. They saved everything for that, and any time Lorena could get any extra money at work, she would put her hand up because this was her obsession. And they posted for a job uh, for something called a router, which basically involved being inside the office, making sure all the equipment, the routing equipment, was working. 
And she looked into it and felt this was a job she could do, and she applied for it. And the company said, no, we only hire men for that job. And then uh, she went to her union, and the union said, no, that's a job for a breadwinner. Mm -hmm. So then she saw this little thing from the EEOC saying, Franklin Roosevelt Jr., who then the head says that uh, if you are being discriminated against, call him. So she wrote a letter. And um, they came and investigated. And the argument from the phone company was that there was a rule that said you couldn't lift anything that was heavier than 30 pounds in Georgia, and there was something that you needed for this job that weighed 31 pounds. Of course, it was on a dolly that you pushed around the office, but it's still there. Meanwhile, poor Lorraine is going in every day and lifting a 40-pound typewriter onto her desk, and that's, you know, that doesn't count. So she, she found, you know, her union was not sympathetic. Nobody wanted to represent her, and she found now, and she wrote to Marguerite Raywald, who then found Sylvia Roberts, the young woman lawyer from Louisiana who couldn't get a job because there were no women lawyers in Louisiana, who became her lawyer, and they went to court, and it took years to get the thing finally settled. But by the end of it, a landmark decision was issued out of Atlanta saying that you could not have these irrational laws that applied only to one sex. It was a huge, huge decision. Uh, they, they think they said it's very romantic to say that you know women can't lift 30 pounds, but it's not the real world. <laughs> And Lorena, once she told me that when she finally applied for Social Security, and all of her children went to college, did very well. And uh, when she went in to put her papers in in her small town, the woman who processed them said, I have never seen a woman with such a large salary in my entire life. You know, she was a groundbreaker. Take us to the Time announcement in 1966 where they write, headline article, I believe, that a good man is hard to find, so hire women. At that time, two-thirds of the new jobs were going to women, most particularly married women. So how did that change things for the country now, the two-income couple? I am very big on the theory that it really is the economy that drives so many of these things. Mm -hmm. um, back in the 20s, when women got the right to vote, they thought that political power was going to transform everything and that their sex would make all these differences, great laws, new changes. Nothing happened. And the reason was that they presumed that women could stay home, not be part of the economic life of the country, but still have power. And that's really the, the, the rub of all this, at least in this country. Unless sure. you're part of the economic world, you don't have any power. And what happened after World War II was that there weren't enough men to fill all the jobs. The economy is exploding. They've got all these new jobs, and there aren't that many guys. You know, the, first of all, not many guys to begin with. They were in the war, and they're all used up. And so the, they, um, they started hiring women in droves uh, to jobs that were better for women because sometimes they weren't, they weren't in factories so much. They tended to be more white-collar jobs, which more women were comfortable with, you know, working in offices, working in stores, often part-time because these were, of course, all married women. There are no single women. There are fewer single women than action figures for women at this <laughs> point in time. So um, this was how women moved into the job market. Yep. They, they were working by the, the, by the 60s in as large a percentages as they had been during World War II. You didn't notice them so much because they were working not as conductors or steel workers. They were working as receptionists and as store clerks and things like that. But they had gone back to the workforce in huge numbers and they never went away again. And they were part of this huge economic boom that established a middle class lifestyle in this country in the 60s that we had never seen in the planet before. You know, that, ev that average families would own a home, that they'd have a car, maybe two cars, that they would expect to send their kids if they could to college, that that was a hope and an expectation, that they would go on vacations. All this stuff was totally new after World War II, but once it had been established, people attached themselves to it very quickly. And when you get into the 70s, you get into a period where suddenly, during the 60s and the 50s, often you could actually support this lifestyle on one salary because housing costs in particular were very low. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you get into the late 60s and the 70s, costs are going up. We have a problem with the oil embargo. I mean, you remember the gas lines of the 70s. There was all this stuff happening. People are being laid off. 
There are a lot of problems, and you could no longer, if you were an average family, support that family and that middle class lifestyle on one salary. So in droves, the answer became women will work. And to me, that's the real crux of this book. Once you get to a point where young women going through their childhood and their young adulthood presume, as a matter of course, that they're going to work that they're going to help support their families, you know, whether or not they have visions that they could take off for a while when their kids are young and all that, but that they'll be working forever to support themselves and their families just as the guys are expecting to do. Once you get to that point, then everything has really changed. And it can't go back because the economy is structured in a way that it can't go back. That's exactly it, and I never thought of it till just now. You know, I, I look back at my own life, my first job, once it was clear to me that I was going to work, okay, well, now how am I going to get to the top? Yeah. How am I going to get an education? Because I'm not interested in continuing to work for $2 an hour. Everything is different sure. when you look upon yourself as a sure. person who's going to work throughout your wow. life. I never thought of it till just now. And Thank here we you. are. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> I want to go back for just a moment to the women, the black women in the rural South. Mm -hmm. You write about something in the book I had never heard of, and it, it is particularly interesting that black women in the rural South were among the real heroines of the movement. And in fact, there's this notion that when they went to a protest, they thought they may end up in jail, so they better dress up. Tell us what that's all about. The first, the early civil rights movement, much like, you know, when you go back and you talk to the women who were not necessarily, partly in the women's rights, and yeah, even the early women's rights movement and the now, the early founders of now, I remember one of them told me we always wore a hat wherever we went. People wanted so much to make it clear that they were not communists, that they were not sort of strange, outside, agitator, hippie people, that they were really respectable, that they always dressed up, and this was true of both the women's movement and the civil rights movement early on. You know, all the young people who sat in at, uh, at restaurants in the early and mid-60s, they always wore, you know, their suits and their, you know, really good clothes. And they went to jail in their, you know, heels and their, you know, <laughs> really hair is always done, everything looks good. And people, and it made a difference, you know, I mean, you, you saw stories in the paper about even by people who opposed integration saying, wow, you know, you go out there and you look and you see all of these young black men and women and they've got their suits on and they're reading their school books while they're sitting at the counter. And then you've got the other side, this real rabble of, you know, white teenagers screaming and they're badly educated and badly dressed. And it was an important contrast. And uh, so that, that went on for quite a while in the early civil rights movement. And, uh, you know, the, some of the women said, you know, you'd go into a small town and if you weren't wearing, you know, a nice dress, the people, the black people who came to meet you sort of felt let down that, you know, you weren't, they were not really getting a serious person here, you know. Different topic. We sit here today in the New York Times, turn back the clock to 1968, headline article, oh my goodness, people are cohabitating. <laughs> That was one of my favorite stories because it shows, among other things, that one of the important things that happened in this, because of the civil rights movement was that authority figures in many parts of the country, particularly in government and academia, really lost confidence in their ability to enforce rules because so many of them were being called into question, beginning with the segregation rules, but then expanding on and on and on. The story of the cohabitation story was a time, it was a great story. I just loved it. It was like this huge announcement. We have discovered this new trend. <laughs> Young college students of opposite sexes are living together in this very city. And uh, they interviewed several couples, um, and they all had pseudonyms because this was so shocking. You would never want the outside <laughs> world to know this was going on. And one of the couples, uh, the woman said that she was from Barnard, and at that time at Barnard you had to live in the dorm. And the dorms had parietals. You had to be home at like 9 or 10 at night. And then you had to stay in your room. You couldn't go out anymore. And the guys, meanwhile, across the street at Columbia are bounding all over the place doing whatever they wanted. So uh, she said she was at Barnard, and she knew she couldn't leave the dorm. So she got a friend to forge a letter saying that she wanted to hire her as a babysitter in her home and to live in her home and to work part-time as a babysitter, and that's how she got out of the dorm. This was way too much information because Barnard took about three seconds to figure out mm -hmm. that this was a <laughs> sophomore named Linda LeClaire. And they called her in, and Linda LeClaire was not repentant 
Uh, she did not <laughs> apologize. In fact, she leafleted the campus. Um, <laughs> and um, it went on for a while, and then the alumni heard about it. The Times started covering this like it was a nuclear war, really. They were so <laughs> fascinated by the story. And uh, finally, the alumni, reading all these stories, are writing to the college saying, what are you doing? This is immoral. And the poor president is caught between them and, again, has really no sense of confidence that she can enforce these rules anymore because they did seem a little strange. So she called a blue ribbon commission together of students and faculty and administrators to decide what to do with Linda LeClaire. And they had meetings and they finally came up with a decree that unless Linda LeClaire apologized and went back to the dorm, she would be permanently banned from the snack bar. <laughs> This did not move Linda LeClaire a great deal, so uh, she went on with her life. But that was sort of the kind of fight she were having right then. Yeah. And the interesting thing, again, was how fast it changed. I have talked to so many women who've said, good Lord, I was in college, and you know, you had to be in by 10 o'clock at night, and you could not bring a guy onto the floor unless there was a special day once a month, and then you had to have the door open, and three feet on the floor, you know, if you were sitting on the bed, that was the rule, all this stuff, you know, these huge rules. And then I went back for my 10th reunion, and it's a co-ed dorm, and there are <laughs> naked guys running around all over the place. It changed very, very, very fast. You write in your book that at the time, and I will add, I still think it's currently true, that women are discouraged from math and science. And what impact do you think that had on our nation? Um, well, we lost a whole lot of great women scientists and mathematicians, and I do think that's changing. I, I you know, see so many you know, now young women, very young women, kids, you know, who are stupendous in math and science. And if you look at the numbers, they're changing. And like everything else, it moves more slowly at the highest levels. So when you're talking about people you know, at NIH or at the very highest levels of research, there's still a ways to go on this. But um, I know so many women scientists who told me all these horror stories about what life was like in the 60s and 70s in the labs. Uh, and I think, I think we're moving past that, but it, it's a great fight. Can't wait till the day that we're there. <laughs> <laughs> Part three of your book, Following Through. Discuss, if you would, something near and dear to my heart that really gets my dander up, and that's something called Ladies' Day in Law School. Ladies' Day in Law School. You know, that was one of the great, all the heroines, or many of the heroines in my book, I think, are, are the women who were the first pioneer women during that years when you're changing things, and who had to go through all the grief so that the next generation of women could go in and say, what's the problem here? Everything seems fine. You know. Uh, they did all the work for the rest of us. And uh, in law schools, the professors were very, very, very reluctant in many campuses to have women in their classes. And they would, um, have a, they would normally not call on them. But then they would have a thing called Ladies' Day, in which on that day, the women in the class would be called on. And some particularly horrendous law professors would use that day to have a discussion about something particularly embarrassing, like rape laws or stuff like that, just to make it very, very, very clear how they felt about the women in their classes. I had a law professor who is now a judge, but she took me aside, this is 20 plus years ago, and talked about her own experience going through you know, law school one day a semester being allowed to speak. And she told me, you never lose sight of you know, what it used to be like. And I think she was kind of warning me not to talk so much. But <laughs> in any event, I'll always remember. Well, there's a wonderful oral history of Catherine Rohrbach, who mm -hmm. was a great civil rights lawyer in Connecticut, who, who litigated the great Griswold versus Connecticut yeah. case that made it, you know, that threw out all the laws prohibiting the sale of birth control. This is also in the 60s that these things are being litigated. And um, she had been a lawyer. She was one of those remarkable women. And she had been a lawyer throughout you know, the 50s and 60s. And she said that when these young women started coming out of law school and going into the courtrooms and stuff, every time she'd see one, she'd go running up and say, hello, 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 hello. And, she'd, and then they looked at me like I was crazy, that they were just themselves going to work. And they couldn't understand why she was so excited to see them there. Um, but there was that whole generation. Whenever I'm in a, a, an event and people ask questions, you know, there's usually somebody who asks me, basically invites me to talk about the struggles I have had and the st overcoming obstacles and so on. And I always tell them I had very little of that because the women who were one second ahead of me filed the suits, 
did the petitions, did all the confrontations with the editors, went through all the stuff you had to go through, and they didn't really benefit from it. It was the ones who came after them who did. And the amazing thing to me is that I know a lot of these women, and they're not bitter. Well, they may be bitter at the paper, right. but they're, not, they're really pleased to see younger women coming up and getting stuff. And to me, that's like the definition of a great heart when you can do things like that. Talk a little bit about your own profession, and that is women in journalism. You write in your book that, and you've mentioned this earlier, that at Newsweek initially, when there were 52 writers, one was a female. You write about something I never heard of, the, the takeover, so to speak, at the Ladies' Home Journal. So talk a little bit about women in the field of journalism. It was, you know, you don't, again, unless you look back, you don't really realize that some of this stuff was going on. The one that just drove me crazy was the National Press Club in Washington, which is a place that often, you know, politicians or other people, if they wanted to make news, would come and address the National Press Club. It's still there. Uh, and women were not allowed to belong. The guys in the mess could bring their neighbor, the insurance agent, next door, but you, women could not belong to the National Press Club, and they couldn't go to these speeches and sit there with the audience. Finally, they agreed to let them stand in the balcony. They had this little tiny, hot, crowded balcony. There was no food there. Everybody, they're looking down. All these people are eating lunch, and you, it's hard to hear, and all the women, and the, Nan Roberts wrote this great book called Girls in the Balcony, which was all about oh, that yeah. period. And at Newsweek, the same thing. You know, Lynn Povich, who was the one woman writer, was the fashion writer. And she said there was no guy who would do it, so they let her do it. But uh, then in 1970, I think it was, Newsweek, covering the women's movement, had this cover story on the women's movement. And they had nobody to assign it to except guys. So they assigned it to a freelance writer, the wife of one of the guys, rather than to any of the other women who were working there as researchers, all hoping to move up someday. Yeah. And that was the thing that really broke the camel's back. And that was when the Newsweek women filed their lawsuit, which was kind of the beginning of a long series of lawsuits in all the media uh, that led to everything. Everything changed. For all women have achieved in the area of the law, for example, there are 50% or more now of your incoming class into law schools are female. Same thing is true of medical schools. You still don't, do not see equality at the top. If you look at the big, large law firms, only 17% have female partners. In medicine, you don't see women in administration. What's it like in journalism? You rose to the top because of your exceptional skill. But generally speaking, is it equal in journalism? Um, it's, I think it's, it's in general, you know, I would never want to speak for the next generation and how they feel about things. I, I find, found it to be not a big problem because, as I said, I was in that generation where they were really happy to have a woman coming in because mm -hmm. they wanted a woman mm -hmm. here or there. Um, but, and, and we're sort of a, a, a an industry in crisis, so it's not the best industry in the world to judge, you know, new hires on right now. But uh, in general, that that's true of every place almost. That you have, if you look at colleges, women are so way whipping men in every aspect of higher education. Way more girls go to college. Way more girls finish college. They do better in college, as you said. Now in the professional schools, they're becoming the majority. There are some, in, you know, entire careers that they used to be barred from, like pharmacy and veterinary medicine. That they're just, I mean, they're right. huge proportions. The thing that happens though is once you get out of college, that slowly changes. And once you look at people ten years out of college. It's the guys who are moving up much faster. And to me, I mean, part of that has got to be discrimination, I, I'm sure. But to me, the big, huge problem is the work-family conflict. And it's amazing to me, you know, that so much of what's happened I would not have guessed when I was in college in the late 60s. But if you had told me that we would get to now and there would still not be as a normal thing quality daycare and after-school programs for everybody who needed them, that you didn't naturally have things in all companies where women could take time off if they needed to take care of their families and then come back and continue to move up, that 
that guys would not be as natural about taking time off and taking care of their kids and stuff as women, that it wouldn't be a 50-50 deal. I would have been stunned. I really thought we were going to get that one right away. Um, and that's, if you look at the women who do really make it to the top, and particularly like in law and business, most of them don't have kids. They're married, but often, but they don't have kids. And, um, and the ones who do are, God bless them, incredible. They're just, those kinds of jobs often demand such a commitment on time when you're trying to you know, become a partner, when you're trying you know, to get the great placement as a resident or whatever. And it's so hard to do that if you have primary responsibility for children at the same time. And I think that explains most of the things that we look out there and see why do women still make on average less than men uh, per hour? Why, do, um, why are there still not even a third of the House and Senate female? Women start political careers later than men do, and that's, I think, primarily because they wait till their kids are older because it's such a time commitment. And that's the thing we have. We've got 50% of the workforce now is female. We rely more on women's labor than any other developed country in the world, and yet we have not figured out who's supposed to be taking care of the kids while everybody's at work. It's just amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, that's your point. We have not, as women, solved, or as a nation, the work-family divide, and the penalty is for women because you point out we do substantially more than our husbands despite the fact that you could say they do a lot more than their fathers oh, did. Oh, guys much better than they were. Yeah, they are, but it's not enough. So women have the choice to delay marriage or to not have children if they really want a good shot at that top job. Or you've got to find a husband who is really, 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 really supportive. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I don't know. I have one story I always tell. When I, was, uh, when I was on the editorial board, there was another guy on the board. I should pay him like a royalty for the story because I tell it so often. His <laughs> name is Steve Weissman, and he's married, he still is married, to Elizabeth Miller, who um, later became our White House correspondent. But at that time, she was on the Metro desk as a reporter, and he was an editorial writer. They had small children, and she, during the war in Kosovo, was sent off to cover the war. It was a big, you know, thing for her. And, you know, she went off for a while. And I ran into Steve one day, and he looked like a dead man. And, he's just, and I said, what is wrong with you? And he said with great tragedy in his voice, my wife's in Albania and the hamster's missing. <laughs> and I always thought you could write a book about what's happened to men and call it my wife's in Albania and the hamster's yeah. missing because they have changed you know, this is not just a story about women. You know, life for men has changed so much in this country, too. And we've not at all resolved all the stuff that's come with that. But, um, you know, the guys that I see running around now are so different from the guys that I knew when I was in high school. Uh, and Nora Ephron always said she really felt sorry for the guys who got married before the rules changed. Because then suddenly <laughs> one day they're like, what, 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 what did I do? You know, it was uh, a whole different world. Well, two follow-up questions to that is women in the military. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that historically, the ban on combat, and now the fact you point out in your book, I think 350,000 women have gone in and out or are serving in Iraq. Still, that is invisible to most of the American public. Yeah, the changes in the military, and it, like all this stuff, it changed when it had to change for practical reasons. Um, Women had served in the military, particularly during wars, and of course women had been nurses under fire, taken prisoner of war, you know, for, you know, in World War II, certainly, and then after. And um, people, for some reason, people were comfortable with the idea of nurses, but they were very uncomfortable with the idea of women being in combat in some way. And um, there were lots of fights about what women's role would be. Women were really discriminated against as to what they could do within the military. And even as we went into this period of huge change, after the changes, there were still rules that said women could not serve in combat positions, which most people in the country really supported. Uh, and it was just this huge, big deal. It was hard on the women in the military in the sense that most of the jobs, I mean, this is the military, for heaven's sake. They, that's what they're there for. They are combat positions. And a lot of stuff you wouldn't think of counted as a combat position. So they were really, their upward mobility was really reduced. The big, huge change happened with the Gulf War because suddenly 
the country was involved in a series of conflicts in which you couldn't really say what the combat position was. Women often drove trucks. That was one of the things they could do. Suddenly, you're in Iraq. Driving a truck is a combat position. And suddenly, you have all these women being killed, women being taken prisoner. You know, all the things that happen to guys tend to happen to women now. And the country just sort of has rolled with it. I've not seen, you know, one uprising of, oh my God, a woman was killed in combat. How could this happen? And I think those women warriors, so to speak, really resent coming home as opposed to a man who's seen as a war hero. Most people don't even realize what it is they did, where they were, and so forth. And that's particularly painful to the women. Yeah, and it's also, as once again, we got the child issue. Um, you know, many of these women are single mothers, right. or they have husbands who are also in the military. And the Army has been very slow in dealing with what happens to the kids when their mothers suddenly shift overseas. You talk about the rules changing for men. One thing that I think is interesting that you raise in your book is, as no-fault divorce uh, comes, also comes the phenomenon of men leaving their aging wives for the young trophy wife. You know, there was, in a, you know, that was another 70s thing. There were like all the, you know, basically in the 70s, you did have see just kind of a breakdown of all of these structures that you had you know, existed before. Women had, one of the great problems with the old rules on women stay at home and are protected by their husbands was that they took no account whatsoever of the women who weren't protected by their husbands, whose husbands left them or abused them or, you know, drank. Drinking was a huge problem. And... It was only really in the 60s and 70s that you really started to confront this. And in the name of fairness, you had a move toward easier divorce laws because it had been very, very difficult to get a divorce. The presumption of divorce was that somebody was at fault, mm -hmm. that this was not something that good-hearted people would agree on, that you know somebody had to be bad and that person had to be identified and punished in some way. So that was when in New York, for instance, which had terrible divorce laws into the 70s, you would often have women who would agree to, to serve as the mistress, to sort of be there in a bedroom with the husband so that their friends could come discover this and then testify in court that they had seen evidence of adultery so that the poor husband and wife could get their divorce because adultery was really the only good reason you could get a divorce in New York back then. So it was really hard, it was really difficult, and it really didn't make any sense. So in the 70s, you had the move toward no-fault divorce where people could just go and say, okay, this isn't working were done and they were done but that led along with all the other things that were happening in the country all the huge changes that were happening to a real sense of panic on the part of traditional wives about their role for which I had total sympathy with the traditional wives that poor traditional wives grew up in a world where everybody told them this was the best possible thing a woman could do. This was the greatest job, the most important job in the world, raising kids. Right. They did it. They took over their homes. They excelled as housekeepers. They took care of their kids. And then suddenly, almost overnight, it's like they're unemployed. They're not working hard. They're, you know, what's wrong with them? And the women's movement was not at all good in some of its forms about understanding where these women were at. There was a lot of talk about marriage as slavery and a lot of looking down on any woman who had spent her life as a housewife. So there was all that sense of dislocation. There was a lot of unemployment, a lot of economic distress. A lot of women had to go to work who didn't want to go to work. And then there was this no-fault divorce thing. And I think, I'm, you know, divorce went up a lot I suspect that in the most part it was women who were relieved to be getting out of divorces, but you did have this sense of fear that suddenly the husband could walk. I'm sure if a husband really wanted to walk out, he walked out before, but that he would walk out and marry, you know, some bimbo or something that, you know, and then you'd be left holding the bag. And the new divorce laws presumed that the goal should be to have the woman support herself, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense if, you know, the woman is another professional but if the woman's been at home for 30 years and the husband meanwhile has been you know running his dental practice or something it was totally unfair sure. to some of these women and also they didn't take into account daycare and child care a lot of sense of dislocation and I have one woman in my book who was a young black woman who grew up in a rather poor family in New York who had a boyfriend by whom she had a child, and the boyfriend then went off to medical school, wanted her to join him. 
and she refused saying, you know, she just knew that how it was about those, you know, doctors would get their degrees and then they'd walk out on their wives. I mean, even all the way down to this poor kid in, in Manhattan, you know, in, in, on the Lower East Side, there was this vision that men would betray you and run off with a younger woman and you'd be left there. And I think that too made younger women more intent on being able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it had a sort of a double whammy. On the one side, you had all these very angry housewives who destroyed the Equal Rights Amendment, for instance. But on the other side, you had all of these children growing up thinking, well, if half of what they say is true, I had better get my degree and be prepared to earn a living for myself in case I need it. That's right. Different question. Mary Tyler Moore. The theme changes. You're going to make it after all. Yeah. Your comment on that. She, you know, the, the big deal with the first Mary Tyler Moore invasion of our household was on the Dick Van Dyke show. And that was a huge moment in which she wore pants playing the housewife. And she was, Laura Petrie was just a housewife, just a housewife. She was a fine housewife, but she was at home with her child. Didn't work, but she didn't wear, you know, the heels and she wore capri pants and she was a very attractive woman, of course. And that was huge. I think it was not so much that you had people objecting to it, but the sponsors were very nervous about the idea. You had this woman in pants running around the house. How would people react? So that was quite a big deal. I think she will you know, be forever known as the first woman who wore pants. Mm -hmm. And then when she did her second show, and it was just shows you that transformation from Bonanza to Mary Tyler Moore in her first, ser uh, first year of the new Mary Tyler Moore show, which became so popular, she was a woman who had been dumped by her fiance, and she came to Minneapolis very sad, and Rhoda was her next door neighbor, and they would talk all the time about how hard it was to find a guy. And I mean, it was just the normal stuff. And as she progressed in the show, and as the show developed, this woman developed into a person who clearly had, not only had dates, but clearly had sex with guys, but who had a very full life with her work and her friends, and never talked about getting married, and it wasn't a big deal. It was a huge first, I think. There were other shows before that, like That Girl, that had kind of explored that. But it was always in a sense of you were this vulnerable child in the city somehow. And this Mary Tyler Moore was just, even for now, it was kind of, would kind of be huge, this sense of a person who doesn't care about getting married. Yeah, even Marlo Thomas and that girl was engaged. Yeah, I forever. Recall. Oh my God! Yeah. And all the episodes were yeah. about something about it looked like she was having sex with somebody else, but she really wasn't. Uh, that was kind of oh yes. Let's mention women's athletics. The Boston Marathon. My God, you can't run that. Your ovaries may fall out. For the longest time, so many of the women told me that in the 50s, in particular, in the early 60s, it was not only you know that you you weren't encouraged to do athletics, but in some places, it was thought that the, the very idea of competition was traumatizing for women and that if they lost a game, they might cry or right. something. So they really <laughs> weren't even allowed to compete. All of athletics for women was seen as something you did for health, not you know, for the fun of competing. And women's teams were treated oh, so pathetically. There was a, a woman from, I think it was Cedar Rapids, Iowa, who said they started a women's movement in Cedar Rapids because at the high school, there was a boys' tennis team and a girls' tennis team, and the boys played on the courts, and the girls had to play on the driveway. And they said they started a women's movement to keep the girls from being run over, basically. <laughs> but huge. That stuff was really huge. Talk, if you would, about women getting into politics. Talk about the Hillary factor and whether, in the final analysis, gender, bias, trumps, all other types of prejudice. You know, um, for the women in the first generation of this women's movement who did all the fighting in the 60s and 70s, the idea of a woman in the White House was just the holy grail. That would be the moment you really knew you'd won when there was a woman in the White House. And they were they all talked about, you know, would there be one within their lifetimes? And they were so sure it was going to be Hillary. Uh, Hillary Clinton was so sure it was going to be Hillary, and when it wasn't, when suddenly out of nowhere this guy came along and took it all, they were, you know, shocked and angry and felt betrayed, and for about, you know, a month there, there was just enormous pain and bitterness, and then, you know, now everybody's fine, I think, but um, what she did 
And that's so important in America. People in America, once they get used to almost anything, they're good with it. And she made people used to the idea that a woman could be the commander in chief. And that's an incredible triumph. And some other woman is gonna to get to be president because of her. Well, there you have it, our journey through time. From housewife and homemaker, to doctor, to lawyer, senator, vice presidential candidate, to one day maybe a president. What's next? Who knows? It depends on you. So until next time, from Times Square here in New York, you be well.